meditation, just like medication or food or exercise has different effects on different people. The field needs to understand that measuring adverse effects is a science in itself, and it, it has to be done in a very specific way. And a lot of the things you learned about measuring benefits don't transfer. In order to have a better science, we need to start paying attention to individual differences. So I want to make sure everybody's experience gets heard and validated and also brought into, looped into the research so that we can make sure these practices are benefiting everyone maximally. Welcome to Mind and Life. I'm Wendy Hasenkamp. This week's episode, I consider somewhat of a public service announcement. You know, we hear in the media almost exclusively about the benefits of meditation, how it can bring positive change to your mind, your body, your life, and it most certainly can do those things. But we don't usually hear about when meditation leads to difficult, unpleasant, or even harmful experiences. These can range from perceptual changes to anxiety and panic, and rarely to more serious emotional and cognitive issues. So today I'm speaking with clinical researcher Willoughby Britton, who's been an absolute pioneer in investigating these kinds of negative outcomes of meditation. She was the first and is still one of the very few researchers to really dig into these experiences in a rigorous way. And she's moving the field forward by helping us understand how these experiences can show up for practitioners, who might be most at risk, how frequent they are, and their impact on people's lives. In our conversation today, we get into all of those issues, as well as how she came to be interested in this work and how the field needs to change to better understand, track, and address these sometimes challenging experiences. I really encourage you to listen to this episode, especially if you teach meditation in any way, but even if you just practice yourself or people you care about practice. What we're learning is that these experiences, at least the mild forms, are likely more prevalent than we've realized as a field, so it's incumbent upon us all to learn about them and be prepared to help if they arise. At the same time, I do want to stress this information is not meant to scare you away from meditation, and I hope it doesn't. As you'll hear, Willoughby herself still believes that these practices can hold huge benefits for people, and so do I. But as a field and a community, we also need to be realistic and stay educated about potential harms. And I should add, if you or anyone you know is experiencing these kind of difficulties related to meditation practice, Willoughby has a project dedicated to helping folks in these situations. It's called Cheetah House, and you can find a link in the show notes along with lots more information about Willoughby's work. Lastly, I just want to say that I think it's taken real courage to shine a light on this kind of shadow side of meditation, experiences that have sometimes been easier to ignore, to sweep under the rug, to explain away. And so I deeply appreciate Willoughby's efforts to bring these issues into the light and into the conversation. Okay, I hope that you find this information valuable. It's a pleasure to share with you Willoughby Britton. Well, I'm here with Willoughby Britton. Willoughby, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've been really looking forward to having you on the podcast because you bring what I think is a kind of a different perspective on the experience of contemplative work. And uh, I think it's one that's not often highlighted, perhaps as much as it should be in the media and the way these things are applied. So I'm really excited to, to get into talking about your work. But before we do that, I'd like to start um, a little bit with your own personal story and how you got interested in meditation to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of people, I was one of those kids that just had a lot of questions. Um, I think at a very early age, I was asking things like, you know, is today tomorrow? What's looking out of my eyes? I was really, really fascinated by questions of consciousness. And my parents were really did not know what to do with me. And I think how I intersected with meditation specifically, this is like fast forward now to my college years. I had a, f a friend in, in college that committed suicide. Mm. 
Mm. Um, and it was like a very, you know, terrible, traumatic, devastating experience and really had no idea how to work with that. And medication was just not something that I wanted to do. And my dad sent me a book by Jack Cornfield, um, A Path with Heart. And, you know, the first half of that was all about just various kinds of difficulties that come up in the mind. And it just really resonated with me. And I think I carried that book around with me like a Bible for, I don't know, a decade. And that was really that was my, my that was my gateway drug Yeah, um, was, it was a path with heart. Um, and then I had a sort of dual life for a while. Mm. Um, so I was a neuroscience major. I was still always interested in the same question, which was like, what is consciousness? What is it for? What are we doing here? Very basic questions. And somehow thought that like going into the neuroscience would answer those questions. And so that I, I was a neuroscience major in college. But strangely enough, like neuroscientists, at least at that point, really did not want to touch consciousness at all. It was kind of like a four letter word. Mm. Um, and so I double majored in, in philosophy and I ended up actually going to India, um, to Dharamsala and, you know, studying Tibetan Buddhism and getting going along, you know, more religious orientations to ask the same questions. And they had a lot more to say about consciousness than, than neuroscientists did. So, so I had this sort of dual life. Um, and then I came back from India and I worked at the National Institute on Drug Abuse in Baltimore um, because, you know, one way to alter your consciousness is with drugs. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I tortured rats for a while um, and had a lot of uh, ethical um, dilemmas around that, you know. And actually, there was a very important moment when I was working at NIH where we were sacrificing the rats and... Mm -hmm. They, I was making little beds for them, and and one of my colleagues was preparing the the guillotine, and um, we, you know, overdosed them with Nembutal, and their eyes start to turn clear, and I was like having this really like powerful moment with like, you know, okay, the the whatever this whatever the animating principle of this animal is, it's it's about to disappear. And, you know, I was having this strong sense of like, where does it go? Where does it go? And I said to this colleague, you know, God, where does it go? And she said, oh, they go in the freezer in 215. Oh, my gosh. You know, and I was like, OK, I'm done. This is the end yeah. of my time at NIH. And I, I remember Googling like consciousness all over the Internet. And I ended up I kept getting this link for Tucson, Arizona. Hmm. You know, and I was like, what is, I, and I kept avoiding it. And eventually I clicked on it and it was like this huge consciousness conference. Right. And so I was like, I feel called to this conference. And I went. And that is when I discovered that there was an entire world out there of scientists who were interested in, in asking these questions. And even better, there was uh, a school, the University mm. of Arizona, that was very open to, you know, answering these types of questions and that I could actually go there. And so that was sort of the how I ended up at the University of Arizona, did my my degree in clinical psychology um, and actually s specialized in sleep, which was, you know, a legal way to that everybody alters their consciousness every day. And right. it also happens to be involved in like practically every part of like health and well-being and everything else. Right. So that's kind of how I ended up. And then I ended up doing my uh, my dissertation on the effects of meditation on sleep. Very cool. And then um, so now you've spent your more recent career studying um, some of the negative side effects or outcomes that can happen with meditation practice. So what, what drew you in that direction? So actually, that first study that I did on meditation and sleep um, started that trajectory. So I think like many people, I had very, you know, universally positive expectations that meditation was, you know, it's relaxing, it's a kind of relaxation technique, it must improve sleep. So I spent like 200 nights, these were, these were um, objectives measurements with, of sleep. And it was going to be the, one of the first studies to demonstrate sort of empirically, um, objectively with brain waves that, that 
uh, mindfulness meditation improves sleep. Um, and I spent, you know, 200 nights measuring people's sleep. And when it was all said and done, the meditation group had every index of cortical arousal that you could imagine. They had less slow wave sleep, you know, less deep sleep more, you know, more faster uh, brain waves, so m- more, hmm. uh, more awakenings, more stage one. And not only that, it was actually correlated like 0.8, very, very high relationship correlation. The more you meditate, the more cortical arousal. Hmm. So I was pretty horrified when that when the data came in. And actually, it, it seemed like such the wrong answer that I didn't publish it. Mm, mm-hmm. um, for many, many years, I just sat on the data. Um, so there's my first confession. <laughs> um, and then uh, during that time, I went was on a meditation retreat and I was sort of telling a teacher about the findings. And the teacher said, you know, I don't know why you psychologists are always trying to make meditation into a relaxation technique. You know, everyone knows if you meditate enough, you stop sleeping. Hmm. Right. In the tradition, that's... So that, that that really shocked me. And I thought, one, what other assumptions are we making about, you know, somebody who had really no training in the history or of where these practices come from, what they were originally designed for, and just kind of buying into all the marketing without really any critical analysis just and, and applying that to my science? Mm-hmm. You know, so what other assumptions are we making and then the second question was, what other information are our meditation teachers sitting on that we should be asking them as, as researchers? And so that was really the beginning of, you know, the varieties of contemplative experience study, which was really just going to meditation teachers and asking them, you know, what types of challenges have you observed in your students um, and what do you do about it? And so, I mean, I think there was there was one other thing that happened in between, which was when I came to Brown to do my residency, there's a very famous in, uh, inpatient psychiatric hospital, Butler Hospital. Um, and while I was doing my residency, there were two yogis that had, that had become psychotic on retreats nearby. Mm. Um, and they ended up in this hospital. And so I thought, wow, two in one year seems like a lot. So mm-hmm. I went back to the same teacher and said, you know, have you ever seen, you know, meditation induced psychosis? And it was clear that that was not a surprise. Hmm. They knew about that, too. And so then I was like, okay, we really need to sit down with these teachers and really like mine their wisdom and find out what they know. And so um, in 2007, we launched the, the Varieties of Contemplative Experience study and went to, you know, various meditation centers um, that I knew and had practiced at. So I, I had already had some connections and simply asked the the directors and various teachers there, you know, what types of meditation related challenges have you observed? Um, how do you make sense of them? Like what interpretive frameworks do you use to interpret them mm. um, and praise what they are? And then and then what do you, you know, how do you respond? Right. And so what was interesting about that was that, the teachers would begin to talk about their their students, but then they would, you know, very naturally slip into, well, when it happened to me. Hmm. And so actually many of the teachers that we interviewed, thinking that they would be speaking as teachers, actually ended up as, as subjects talking about their own experience. So right. in the end, we had 60 people talking about their own experience and 60% of those were actually meditation teachers. Oh, wow. I didn't realize yeah. that. I mean, we had a separate set of interviews about teachers and other experts that were being interviewed as experts. So they spoke about others. Right. And also, I know that you, at some point in this trajectory, developed an organization, a home for people who are having these kind of really difficult problems related to meditation called Cheetah House. Can you talk a little bit about that and like how did that uh, layer into your research questions and experience? Yeah, so the, the history of Cheetah House is on the Cheetah House website. So we can you can people can go and, and kind of read the longer version. But basically, so I am, you know, faculty at Brown University and we have one of the oldest 
um, you know, concentrations in contemplative studies, I think, ever. And so we have uh, courses at Brown that have meditation labs in them. So students get credit for learning types of practices, and it's extremely popular. And so what ends up happening, and this is back in like 2008, um, was that students would start to get really interested in uh, contemplative practices, contemplative philosophy, and they would they would leave Brown and they would ordain in in, in India. Mm. Um, and then, you know, they would come back to Brown and they'd want to be they'd want to go back to school, but they'd be celibate. They wouldn't do drugs that, you know, they were like not taking intoxicants. They would be silent for a lot of times. They're studying Sanskrit. They were like, you know, and Brown wanted to put them in the dorms where nobody's celibate or abstaining from anything. And so basically I, I have this um, this old Victorian house that's about six blocks away from Brown campus and ha- you know has a, a couple extra floors on it. And so I was in a position to be able to create a space, a community space where students that were, you know, either moving into or out of some kind of monastic lifestyle would have a place to, have community and and have their lifestyle supported. So so that was the original kind of cheetah house vision mm. um, was to support brown students. But the idea was pretty popular outside of brown students. So other people who are interested in sort of transitioning or living a semi monastic life mm. could do that here. And then when we started the varieties of, of contemplative experience study you know, we would be interviewing people and they would say, I just got out of the hospital. I'm living with my parents. I'm, you know, I'm 27. Mm. I can't work yet, but I don't really want to be in the hospital either. And so it also just kind of became an organic transition to people who had had difficulties a lot of them were, you know, met cri- the first criteria, which was that they were transitioning out of monastic life just in a fairly traumatic way. Mm. Um, and so so some of them, you know, had been on retreat and just needed time to integrate whatever they had experienced. And so Cheetah House provided uh, a residential space for that for about five years. So I'd say between 2008 and 2015, people could live here and um, have their practice supported or have their integration supported. And there's a lots to say about that type of model and how mm-hmm. um, it's a great model, but I did it, but it was unfeasible. Yeah. Um, and so Cheetah House is now um, entirely online. It's international. Um, and we meet in Zoom rooms like everyone else. And so that um, first study that you mentioned, the varieties of contemplative experience, what did that reveal? You said it was really in-depth interviews with about 60 folks who were reporting these difficulties. So we, I think we did about a little over 90 interviews. Um, so 60 of those were people talking about their own experience. And then there were 33, I think, uh, experts. So people who are um, either teachers or clinicians or both. So that yielded 3000 pages of transcripts. <laughs> wow. So we're still working on what those are, but we did publish a sort of overview study um, in 2017 in PLOS One, uh, where we we described, we basically published two code books. Um, and so code books are ways of organizing qualitative information. And so the first code book was phenomenology, which are what are the possible challenges Mm-hmm. And we arranged that in seven domains of, you know, human experience. So things like affect or emotions, you know, bodily or somatic experiences, cognitive experiences, sense of self, um, cognitive or motivation and social, um, perceptual, things like that. Just to give a flavor, maybe, can you give some examples of these kinds of experiences? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, probably the most common one that I think most people can relate to are changes in perceptual sensitivity. So things like colors get brighter, you start to notice the clock ticking on the wall. Um, you know, there's there's certain kinds of just you become more sensitive in multimodal sensory way. 
And I think this is also a good example of some of the why appraisal became such an important part of the interview and the study because perceptual sensitivity is pretty awesome. You know, like yeah. it's one of my favorite parts of, of practice is that things get a, like you get a little kick in, 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 you know, it's called hyperchromia. Like everything gets richer and there's a right. certain colors get richer. Um, the sound dimension can be really cool when you're in nature and you hear all the birds and you hear the river and you hear the wind and it's how lovely that is and how quickly that can change when you come home to the city mm. and you hear every car door slam. And when the truck goes by, you feel it vibrating through your body. Um, same exact experience, but now suddenly it's very unpleasant and, and can be interfering with your ability to function. And so what one of the main take home lessons that we learned um, from that study was that no experience is really inherently adverse or negative, um, but that like the the valence can really flip at any time. Hmm. Um, And so you have to really watch. It's not a stable trait of the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the same experience can flip valence in the same person. Similarly, the same experience or similar experiences can be Um, appraised as positive or negative by different people, depending on their cultural context or their goals or their orientation of definitions of well-being. So that was a very tricky part. Um, And I think one that is especially apparent in meditation studies and research, because meditation has many different goals and many different contexts that it's being practiced in. Um, but when I wrote this second paper, it's really it's an underappreciated dimension of of sort of harms monitoring in general. That yeah. there's lots of side effects of medications that can flip valence very easily. For example, when you take cold medicine, like the kind that makes you sleepy, you know that's not the intended uh, effect of the the drug. Right. It's it's meant to help you with your congestion. Right. You know, it's and it's considered an adverse effect when you take it in the morning when you're trying to be awake. Right. But a lot of people take, you know, antihistamines and these types of drugs on planes. So they make sure they sleep to their destination or they just use them at bedtime to sleep better. Yeah. And so, again, same exact experience. The phenomenology is the same. And whether it's desirable or not can change within the same person. So really, really important piece of that study. And I know I digressed into that. No, no problem. I can go back to the phenomenology because that's a really important piece of the other, the other things that happen. So perceptual sensitivity, that's a really common one. Um, The ones that tend to be appraised as more unpleasant are are things like uh, anxiety, panic, fear, those mm-hmm. were the most common, and I would say in all of the work that I've done in different populations continue to be the most common. Mm-hmm. So things on the sort of anxiety spectrum, you know, emotions can get louder or softer. So mm-hmm. you can see, um, you know, increases in emotional lability, emotional reactivity, um, just every emotion can be sensitized just like your senses. Uh Um, But you can also see the opposite happen. So you can also see a loss of emotion, emotional blunting, um, more kind of flat loss of motivation types of Uh things. On the more serious side, we have seen people um, develop symptoms that clinicians would categorize as psychosis or Uh uh, mania Uh and often require hospitalization. And those are more rare, you said? I mean, we haven't done a. We just recently did an epidemiological study, so we have a better sense of some of the frequencies. With the Varieties Project, it wasn't set up to really measure frequency. So within the 60 people, we can get a sense of like what's relatively more or less common. And again, I'm sort of drawing from two different populations. One were the people that we recruited in the Varieties Project, which were primarily Buddhist meditators from the three different schools of Buddhism. And then within Cheetah House, we get a kind of a steady stream of of meditators from all various types of 
programs and products. And so it, it does seem like the people who end up having psychotic reactions is maybe one in 50. Okay. Compared to the all the other ones tend to be more dysregulated arousal, perceptual hypersensitivity, pain syndromes, anxiety, panic, and dissociation. Those are like much, much more common. And when you say one in 50, do you mean one in 50 of the people that you have been working with or of like anyone who would meditate? Yeah. So when you get to the questions of frequency, yeah, um, just, a, just a general rule is that the frequencies are going to radically change depending on how you measure them and what your denominator is. Mm -hmm. So in response to your question, one out of every 50 people that show up at Cheetah House, that, 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 that sign up for a consultation at Cheetah House, um, have had some kind of psychotic symptoms. Okay. Yeah, but that is not in any way a reflection of meditators in general. So make sure people hear that. Right. These are already people who are having issues. Right. a sense of um, the mechanism of any of these issues, like given all of your, you know, prior work in neuroscience and thinking about arousal systems and um, particularly since anxiety and panic and fear are such a common experience around meditation. What is your sense of what's going on there? You know, when I initially started this, I thought, oh man, I'm going to have to have this like entire new research agenda. It's going to take 20 years to figure out why these things happen. Um, but I actually think the mechanisms that I've been studying for the last 20 years as well for the benefits mm -hmm. are the same um, as for the adverse effects, just in some ways overtrained. And so mm -hmm. I did write a paper about this called Can Mindfulness Be Too Much of a Good Thing? Mm. And it takes on the idea of the inverted U-shaped curve where you know anything when when taken to an extreme um, will start to have diminishing returns or um, trade-offs. So I'll give you an example actually from my own research. So I spent you know, most of my time in, in meditation research, looking at how do mindfulness-based interventions specifically, how can they be used to improve, you know, mood disorders, dysregulated emotion problems like anxiety and depression. Mm. Um, and I focused a lot on prefrontal control over the limbic system. So that was kind of my main jam for 20 mm -hmm. years and got lots of grants to do that. And it looks like you know, certain types of meditation practice are pretty good at, you know, strengthening prefrontal control over the limbic mm -hmm. system. And that will really help people be able to regulate their emotions. Um, there's lots and lots of converging data for that, um, which is great. But what if you keep going? What if you keep training and keep, you know, um, regulating? What if you overregulate? your limbic system mm. and your amygdala. Is that possible? And so then I found, I discovered that if you look at the neural correlates of dissociation, which is one of the things we're seeing as a result of meditation and is characterized by a very flat, you know, affect, people are not experiencing their emotions as strongly. Mm. It has almost identical neural correlates to what I was touting as the mechanism of all the benefits, which is, mm -hmm. you know, very strong prefrontal activation and, and, you know, consequently a downregulation of the limbic system and the amygdala. Mm, interesting. So that's one possibility of how somebody could become dissociated and blunted. Uh, in terms of anxiety, um, there's, you know, I think there's, there were, we came up with 59 separate categories in the varieties project. So it's possible that we have 59 mechanisms to work out, but <laughs> um, I don't think so. I think a lot of them, them come together. Mm -hmm. So for anxiety, I think one of the places to look is the insula cortex. 
So if you look, you know, often we talk about the insular cortex and, and interoception as just being like, you can never have enough body awareness. And, you know, if you, if you pay attention to your body and do body scans and focus on your breathing and really just bring attention to the sensory dimensions of your experience, then like everything will be better because you won't be engaged in thinking as much. Uh-huh. That's kind of the, you know, the model that I was taught. But if you look at, you know, the the RDOC criteria for anxiety, which is sort of the, the NIH's plan to try to map out all of the ways we can sort of biologically map certain states and certain problems, you'll see that, you know, insula activation is highly correlated with all kinds of different anxiety-related issues. Anxiety, panic disorder, um, flashbacks are all associated with high levels of insula activation. And, you know, we know that that having very strong interoceptive accuracy doesn't always pan out to be, you know, more beneficial for well-being. It often, if it can often be associated with anxiety proneness. Mm. So, um, and, and, you know, we've heard a lot from, you know, now there's a whole kind of movement in trauma-informed modifications and trauma-informed mindfulness that, if you are, if you have a trauma history and you're prone to anxiety, that doing body-based meditation practices might be contraindicated. Hmm. But the more time you spend focusing on your body, um, you know that can really amp up the insula and kind of amp up all of your emotional intensity. Which it sort of makes sense that, you know, if you're having anxiety, you know, where is that? Where does that exist in your experience? Well, often in the midline of your body. Right. Right. It's probably not in your hands so much in your feet, but it's in, you know, it's somewhere between your chin and your waist and often in the midline. And then often we're taught to, you know, focus on our breathing, which is right in the midline of our bodies. Right. And so for a lot of people, focusing on the breathing is very calming. Um, But for people who already have anxiety in their bodies, like putting your attention right where the anxiety is, is, it just amplifies it. And it amplifies it not only in our experience, but also in our brains, because we're basically increasing our sensory representation and intensity. So there's another possible, you know, mechanism. Yeah. And is that similar to what you would think, too, about like perceptual sensitivity being increased? So, you know, I have a whole bunch of different models. Actually, the first. um, So here's my second confession. My second confession is that um, I ended up marrying my co-author, Jared Lindahl. Um, And the way that that happened was that his dissertation was on experiences of light and luminosity in both Christian and Buddhist contemplative practices, which is super cool. Yeah. One of the side effects that we documented, one of the first ones within the Varieties Project was experiences of light and luminosity. So these little, they're Mm. called in in Tibetan, they're called tigles. And um, in Theravada Buddhism, they're called nimittas, where there's these little little lights or like stars. You see with your eyes closed or? Eyes closed, eyes open. Okay. Um, You know, some might call them hallucinations, but they're very Mm. well-known phenomenology. And so... Uh, Jared and I got together to write a paper about why, you know, why would meditation cause these experiences? So I, I took the neurobiology on and Jared took on, you know, how do the various different traditions make sense of them mm-hmm. um, and, and what do they mean? So in that paper, and you're going to have to have so many links to different papers. Yes, we will link to all these, which is great. So that was the the 2014 paper on uh, meditation-induced light experiences. Um, We come up with a a theory called homeostatic neuroplasticity. And so the the idea behind that is that there are certain dimensions of meditation practice that mimic the dimensions of sensory deprivation. So, for example, we're sitting still, so we have a kinesthetic deprivation. Um, our eyes are closed or we're having a fixed gaze. You don't tend to look around very much. You're in a silent room, hopefully. And, you know, and then the, the, one of the most important parts that we added was that concentration itself um, has a sensory gating effect. 
And mm. so, you know, I think when you concentrate on something, so let's say you focus on the breath, you know, your attention is going to this, this one dimension of your experience, this one sensation, um, but it's actually blocking out everything else. And that blocking effect actually has a sort of a sensory gating effect. And so based on what we know from sensory deprivation studies, you know, in animals and, and, and in people who have, there's the, the military actually did some amazing sensory deprivation studies actually yeah. with Donald Hebb. And they're very well funded. So we know a lot about what happens in sensory deprivation in humans. And so what happens is the brain tends to have a certain level of stimulation that it likes, um, a sort of a set point of stimulation. And if you block that, it will it will counteract that by upregulating itself. It'll like create it but on its own. Yeah. I mean, we all I mean, if you think about it, like if you go into a dark room for a long enough period of time and then you're, you know, you say, Are my eyes adjust and then you walk outside right. and it's very bright. That's a very good right. example. Like you will, you, it will upregulate itself. So, so when you concentrate and you're in and you do these other sort of forms of pseudo deprivation, um, all the areas of your brain that were not allowed to, you know, sort of that were getting gated or blocked are going to upregulate. And so that could be any area of the brain. So we tend to we tend to notice that in in, sen in sensory ways, but there's no reason that it couldn't be, you know, an emotional dimension of the brain where you would have disinhibition of the limbic system, and that would manifest as flashbacks, you know, sudden sudden flooding of of, of emotions. Mm. Um, we you know we we described it in this paper uh, uh, as when you have gating of the of the visual system. You know, you start the first thing you have when you start to have an upregulation and sensitivity is colors get brighter, mm -hmm. perceptual sensitivity, all the fun stuff. But then if you continue to have this deprivation, you start to have hallucinations because mm. you have spontaneous. It, it basically this, the upregulation of the, the neuron actually will start to spontaneously fire, eventually will sp spontaneously fire. And that will be experienced as a hallucination. Mm. Um, and so. And that's what, you know, we're seeing basically that these nematas and these tiglays, these, these star-like light processes um, are basically, and, and, and this is across traditions, it's a, it's a sign that your concentration's getting good. Mm, wow. Because you're so narrowed and like blocking it. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're, because your brain is like, it's mm -hmm. showing that you're, you know, that you're basically really good at blocking your, your visual system's input. So that's another idea that like with a lot of concentration practice, you can start to see these kind of disinhibition type, you know, analogous to, to visual hallucinations, but mm -hmm. in different systems. Um, we also see motor spontaneous firings, which, mm -hmm. which, you know, show up as ticks, convulsions, jerks, um, things like that. So mm -hmm. again, this is just a informed possibility. Yeah. This is a little bit of a sidebar, but it's making me think of, um, is this the same mechanism for like tinnitus when people have a ringing in the ears? Is that's also a hallucination, right? Um, so, yep. So tinnitus is another one of the uh, more unpleasant um, mm. side effects. So people tend to have auditory hypersensitivity first where they, you know, like okay. they notice the clock ticking and then it and then it generalizes to this sort of spontaneous firing of auditory neurons and, yeah. and, and, and causes this ringing. So, yep, that, that is a general thing that happens. And I think, you know, in addition to the homeostatic neuroplasticity, which is a very general kind of concentration based practice, there, there have been a lot of studies on, um, non-habituation, um, or which is also called sensitization. So typically when you have repeated stimuli, the brain tends to habituate. It stops responding to them. But we know that um, in meditators, that habituation process doesn't always happen. Meditation itself can prevent habituation. Mm -hmm. And in the book Altered Traits, there's a quote from Richie who says like, oh, you know, habituation makes life dull, you know, <laughs> and, and, and non-habituation, you know, make, keeps things fresh. But um, there was a study actually done by Sarah Lazar's group at Harvard where the stimuli that they were experimenting with were actually electric shocks. 
Mm. And and so meditators did not habituate to electric shocks. And, you know, they interpreted that as, it, you know, they kept the, the freshness of the stimuli. And I'm thinking, wait a second, some things you want to habituate to. Right. That's not necessarily something you want to keep the freshness of. Yeah. So so that's another possible, you know, mechanism to keep an eye on is this non-habituation. If you look it's often portrayed as being this really beneficial thing, and I think it can be. Um, but if you look into the clinical literature around non-habituation, it tends to be something that is is associated with a lot of psychiatric issues. So um, it's something. It's, it doesn't tend to be a, a very positive thing to cultivate. So now fast forward a little bit and you have two more recent papers continuing this line of work, you know, one in particular getting even more rigorous and looking at how we can evaluate these types of outcomes in a more systematic way as we're delivering these interventions. Uh, do you want to share some of those findings? Sure. So I think the first paper, which was called Defining and Measuring Meditation-Related Adverse Effects in the Context of Mindfulness-Based Programs was really like a replication study of the Varieties Project. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it came out of the question that we got a lot, which was, okay, you know, th this is the Varieties Project occurred in meditators often doing a long retreats and who were Buddhist. And um, how does that transfer or does it transfer to the secular mindfulness programs? Right. And so we basically took the code book from the Varieties Project, and at the very, very end of a randomized clinical trial, it was actually a dismantling study looking at mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and then comparing that to focused attention only and open monitoring only. So there were kind of single, single practice, eight-week programs. And then at week 20, so the very, very last thing we did was we asked them, we went, we basically read them the code book and asked them if they had had any of these experiences. Mm. And we were very careful to have them grade them or rate them or praise them themselves mm -hmm. and not call them adverse effects, but rather say like, you know, did you have any um, changes in your perceptual sensitivity? And if they said yes, you know, was that positive, negative or neutral? Right. Um, and then in addition to we call that valence. Um, so when it was happening, was it positive, negative, or neutral? And then we also asked a separate question, which was, what was the impact on your life? Because sometimes you can have a really negative experience in meditation, but it ends up like eventually becoming really healing or really right. positive. So we wanted to make sure that we separated out those things. Um, and so while I was thinking about that study and designing it and collecting the data, I just it just became apparent that um, there was actually a study published this year, a meta-analysis by Miguel Farias, where he, he went through 7,000 different meditation studies, and he, he found that only 1% of them even mentioned adverse effects. Exactly. Yeah. This is such, a, such an important issue that your work raises, is that usually this isn't even asked about, right, in all these studies. Right. And like, I mean, OK, here's my third confession. Third <laughs> confession is like often often you have to have some kind of statement about adverse effects in your in your s studies. And so. I never measured adverse effects. I just assumed there weren't any and no one's no one ever said anything. So I was like, I would just make a statement like there were no adverse effects in the study. But and that's what everybody does. Right. And, you know, now, you know, fast forward 10 years, I'm like horrified that. I just stated there are no adverse effects, but I actually never measured them. And that's actually exactly how we've been doing things. And so I think that part of the impetus behind this paper was the field needs to understand that measuring adverse effects is a science in itself. And it, it has to be done in a very specific way. And a lot of the things you learned about measuring benefits don't transfer. 
Mm. So I think, you know, everybody wants to talk about the results of the paper, but I want to like spend a lot of time focusing on table one, which was 24 different guidelines on how to properly measure adverse effects. And one of them, you know, most importantly is don't assume that your patients or your research subjects are going to spontaneously tell you that they had an adverse effect. In fact, they're not. In fact, they might even lie. Wow. Yeah. So you need to you have to be systematic. You have to ask each person. It needs the person who's asking the questions needs to be somebody other than the teacher. Because there's like a pressure to report positive stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We want to like be the good meditator. We want to please the teacher. We also doubt definitely don't want to tell the teacher that whatever they're doing is like harming us. Right. Um, so it needs to be, you know, an independent person outside of that or or at least a, a questionnaire, which actually helps a lot with the face-to-face yeah. problems. And you also don't want to ask people, and again, I've done this in my own, I'm a, I'm a mindfulness teacher, you know, classic situation is that everybody comes back for the week and you ask, did anyone have any challenges this week? And every and it's like crickets right. because nobody's right. going to announce it in front of everybody else. So right. it also needs to be private. Yeah, there's. I feel like there's also a sense in that context of feeling like, well, I must not be doing it right or, you know, I'm a failure because I'm having these issues. And so that's also like there's a shame around it or something. Well, and, and it's it's sort of just like it's this echo chamber that reverberates and like strengthens itself because people have never heard of adverse effects. And right. so they're like, well, if I'm having them, like I've never heard of this before. Therefore, if I'm having it, there must be something wrong with me and I'm doing something wrong. So I just won't say anything, you know, and the teachers have never heard of it either. Right. Yeah. And so that's one piece. And then the next piece is that you need to ask specific questions. You can't just ask. So so in our study, and this is sort of the first um, maybe result, was the first thing we did is we asked them, did you have any unexpected, unpleasant, adverse effects as a result of your meditation practice in this program? And most people, when you ask them an open-ended question like that, they say no. Mm-hmm. But then when you follow up with specific questions, then they, you know, then it changes. So you can't ask open-ended questions either. I think the open-ended question underestimated the frequency by about 70%. Wow. So in terms of the actual sort of numbers, um, which I, I, I will say again, like, don't focus too much on the numbers, you know, the, the fre- whenever you see a frequency, I think the most important information to know right now about frequency is that it's not zero. Right, right. That like any study that's looking at meditation related adverse effects is finding some. Mm-hmm. And like the exact numbers are going to depend on a lot of factors. So don't focus too much on the exact numbers. So with that major caveat, I will now recite the numbers, <laughs> um, which is the first number was did the category replicate? So did the person report that they had had a category from the VCE project, you know, as a result of their meditation practice in the context of this mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program? So is the same stuff coming up for the, the Buddhist meditators and, and these? Right. But, but we didn't say anything about valence. Mm-hmm. So you know, were people having perceptual hypersensitivity? And it doesn't matter whether it was positive, negative, or neutral, um, whether it was the best thing ever or the worst thing ever. It was like, just was it, was the category mm-hmm. present? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we found that 83% of the sample, and you can check the numbers on the paper, but I think it was, it was a very high number, um, experienced at least one category from the Varieties Project, and that more than 80% of the categories in that in the VCE project replicated. Mm. So that first point is many of the same experiences that are being reported as potentially challenging um, in advanced meditators or people on retreat in Buddhist retreat settings are replicating in the context of mindfulness based programs. Fortunately, some of the things that did not replicate were the more serious experiences related to psychosis, delusions, and mania. Okay. So they, you know, they they did tend to be milder and more um, shorter in duration. So the next category was what percentage of people had uh, a negatively valenced experience. 
Um, and I think it was about 58%. And by the way, a negatively valence experience, I do not consider, you know, a sort of adverse effect. Like, okay. Or like as a clinician, I don't, I don't worry about that. That's just like a transient negative experience. And right. like, if you're not having that in your meditation practice, like you're sleeping, <laughs> you know, um, but I think more importantly is like, how is your practice and the experiences in your practice affecting your life off the cushion? So I'm much more interested in the category that we looked at negative impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there was, I think with 38% reported an experience that had some kind of negative impact on their life. And that included anything that was a change in behavior. So I didn't want to meditate anymore. I wanted to meditate less. I had to change my practice. I had to take an aspirin. Um, a really common one was I didn't feel safe to drive. Mm, because of perceptual issues? Well, I felt a little like spaced out and a little like kind of not, not, not a hundred percent. So I, you know, took a walk around the block a couple times and, okay. you know, or I had a friend pick me up. This happened actually um, on the retreat day. Hmm. And by the way, I never knew about it. I was one of the teachers. No one ever told me um, that they were walking around the block, you mm-hmm. know, around Brown, trying to trying to sort of sober up after the retreat. No one ever huh. told me that. I had to find out after, you know, an independent person interviewed them. Right, right. Um, and then the last thing that we were trying to find some some conversation with other studies, particularly around um, psychotherapy. And so there was a very famous study by Crawford in 2016 that they asked people about lasting bad effects from from psychotherapy. They didn't define lasting bad effects. They just asked people if they'd have them. So we Hmm. use those same words, but we just decided to really define it, Um, although it was unclear exactly what lasting was. So um, so we decided to give three different definitions. So at least a day, at least a week, or at least a month, were our kind okay. of three levels of lasting. And then a bad effect was anything that had a negative impact on uh, life or functioning. And so we ended up with a final um, numbers were 6 to 15% uh, lasting bad effects, which, by the way, is almost identical to what the Crawford study and subsequent studies of... Um, adverse effects in psychotherapy have found. So we loosely, tentatively concluded that, that, you know, the, the rates of lasting bad effects in mindfulness programs are, are in the same ballpark Mm -hmm. as, as what we're seeing in psychotherapy. So that was another sort of take home message. And, and I think probably the most important message that I think is, is not going to change so much you know, like it's not as, as it's not as dependent as the frequency uh, numbers is what were the exact experiences that were coming up, you know, kind of as clinicians, as meditators, what do we need to worry about? Mm-hmm. Um, and the answer was largely dysregulated arousal. So we're seeing um, anxiety, agitation, involuntary movements, perceptual hypersensitivity, kind of on the hyper arousal side of things, flashbacks, um, traumatic re-experiencing, and then on the dissociation side, you know, emotional blunting, just feeling spacey and checked out and having some disturbances and sense of self. Hmm. Which goes back to your original work on sleep, right? With the more arousal. Yep. So insomnia was also one of the hyper arousal symptoms. So... Based on that, uh, I was able to, or actually at the same t- around the same time when I ha- that data came out, um, another friend of mine, the director of the Mindfulness Center at Brown, Eric Laux, mm-hmm. he gave me the challenge. He's like, okay, I want to measure adverse effects in my, in my randomized control trial, but like he really didn't want to like burden the participants. And so he gave me the challenge of, you have to make a questionnaire that is only 10 items long. And they have to be promise items, which is the patient reported outcome measures from NI- the NIH toolbox. So they have to be like validated measures oh, um, okay. that are already out there. And so I created a 10 item scale with those parameters. So they're all uh-huh. validated items from, ver- from the promise toolbox. Um, 
but they were also based on, you know, sort of the, the most common and also the most problematic categories that came up within this, this mindfulness-based program study. And the reason I'm telling you this is because that is the, the questionnaire that Simon Goldberg used in his study. And so we can maybe transition over to that study unless you Yeah, have... yeah. That was a more large population-based study, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think the... And you can interview Simon and Richie about their, um, you know, the backstory behind that. But I think, um, again, we don't really know. I mean, everybody asks, like, what is the frequency of these meditation-related adverse effects? And we really don't know. And mm -hmm. one of the problems is because of you know, of, of the sampling of the denominator. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, our study doesn't help because we sampled people based on, have you ever had a meditation related adverse effects? So, right. our, you know, it was a hundred percent in our study. That's not going to help. Some of the other studies, um, there's a one by Marco Schlosser and um, they did multi-country online questionnaires, but they were, they sampled regular meditators Okay, and I and I and I don't know if that was something that was very specifically defined, but I think it was like more than once a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, within whatever a regular meditator is, within re regular meditators, you know, unpleasant or adverse effects were reported actually in both studies by twenty five percent of meditators. Mm -hmm. So, you know, within that sample, we have a kind of a a hit rate of twenty five percent, but. If you if you sample people who have more practice experience, you're going to elevate the numbers. And so mm -hmm. I'm guessing that that Richie and Simon wanted to get, you know, the most representative sample, which is, you know, basically anyone who's tried meditation even once. That's pretty representative. Right. Yeah. So Simon reached out to me and asked about, you know, how do we measure these things correctly? Um, which is really great because I was like, oh, I have so much to tell you. And I spent hours just filling his head with like everything I'd learned and, and, and you know, all the pitfalls. And, and, and also I had this questionnaire like pretty much ready to go. So he used that questionnaire and I'm not, I'm not quite as familiar with the data from that study. So I'd have to like, you have to double check me on this, but I think that there were a couple of things to learn. One, and just, just to notice that the way that meditation was defined was defined by the National Health Survey, which was, it's a lot of different kinds of meditation. It's not mm. just mindfulness or Buddhist meditation. So mm -hmm. it includes Christian forms of meditation and also all the app use and, and that kind of thing. So it's a very, very broad definition of meditation. And we didn't we haven't looked more closely at like which types we're talking about. So I just want to put that okay. caveat in there. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that came out of that study that was pretty surprising was based on the, the epidemiological sample, about 50%, I think it was 49% of the sample had meditated at least once. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've all been watching these various national health survey numbers, you know, over the years and there was one in 2012 and then you know and the numbers keep jumping right yeah um but now this is the highest one so far so half of the population of the u.s has tried meditation at least once wow right based on the survey yeah so that was a finding that i thought was pretty pretty striking and i think that you know half of the sample about the same amount had also reported at least one um, negative experience um, from meditation. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not sure I I care that much about unpleasant experiences because I think they're pretty common. Um, but we did ask about impairment. Mm -hmm. um, and so 10% of that sample reported that they'd had a meditation-related experience that had resulted in impairment in functioning. Mm. So I think, you know, when you're talking about numbers and you do an epidemiological sample, I think that's they're a little bit more reliable, especially because there was more than 500 people in the study. Right. Um, so 10 percent. And then the other number that I remember was how many people have impairment in functioning that lasts more than a month, um, which was kind of my definition of like what harm is or, mm -hmm. or lasting bad effects. 
And that number was 1.2 percent. Okay. So, again, the, the the numbers are not zero. Right. I think yeah, it's clear that's the main take home is like right. This is happening, you know, in communities of people who are practicing. So, how do you now like stepping back, knowing this, and um, I feel like you've really shined such a light on this important piece of this experience that like we've been talking about is just not reported often, but people may be struggling with it, you know, silently. How do you balance that kind of caution or awareness with your general thoughts about the benefits of contemplative practice? How do you think through that? I mean, I think this U-shaped curve paper like really kind of takes a, a model that can accommodate both the benefits and the adverse effects. And it's really just that I think when people first interface with my research, often it's like you're saying meditation is bad or something. Like yeah. it's like a very black and white either or kind of thing. And it's yeah. like, no, there's room for everybody here. Yeah. You know, it's more like I think a, a, a diversity approach where mm-hmm. like, you know, meditation, just like medication or food or exercise or whatever, like has different effects on different people. Mm-hmm. Of course it does. Yeah. You know, and that like in order to have a better science, like we need to start paying attention to individual differences. In fact, in, ha- in order to have an ethical science and an ethical practice, we need to start paying attention to individual differences. And so I think, yeah, I mean, there's always been an ethical dimension to this. And this has been something that has sort of carried over from my practice. But it started to bother me that we have historically reported our results in, in forms of averages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, you know, especially in in treatment studies where if your if your treatment group, you know, is a standard deviation better than the control group, then you say it works. And, you know, you're sort of only representing a certain subgroup of your sample who are kind of the privileged subgroup, the people who got better. Yeah. But in every study, there are people that didn't get better and there are people that got worse. And like, yeah. in some ways, the the use of averages, I mean, this is going to be a strong statement, but it, it's kind of like, it's a form of systemic oppression and silencing of certain dis- mm. perspectives and, and, and experiences. And so, you know, to some extent, I want to make sure everybody's experience gets heard and validated and also brought into, looped into the research so that we can make sure these practices are benefiting everyone maximally. You've been now offering trainings, too, for clinicians and folks who are teaching mindfulness or applying mindfulness in their work to try to get them aware of this and have them start measuring it. Yep. So I partner with uh, David Trelevin, who wrote the book Trauma Sensitive Mindfulness, and Jared Lindahl, who specializes in the the history and cognitive science of religion and, and really brings in the sort of Buddhist piece Um, We offer a 20 hour training called First Do No Harm, and we've given that training to most of the mindfulness centers like all over the world. So UMass, UCLA, UCSD, uh, all throughout Canada, all throughout Europe. And we also do sort of custom versions that are shorter. Um, so if your organization is interested in getting trained and we're actually training the, the nature conservancy right now. Oh, great. Yeah. So we offer trainings for different groups, um, also apps. So one of the, one of the other findings from the Goldberg study, so this was the epidemiological study, uh, was that when you get big numbers, you can actually look at risk factors. Mm-hmm. And we found that trauma history, mm-hmm. early trauma history was a risk factor. And so was app use. Hmm. And so and I think most people are now their their introduction to meditation now is through apps. Yeah. Um, and the fact that that's a risk factor for adverse effects, I don't think is surprising because it's like there's basically no teacher and no supervision and no help, you know, so. Right. Right. That's and, and also no tailoring. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But I think like 
at Cheetah House, we've had in 2020, we had 20,000 people visit. Wow. Um, so you 20,000 unique visitors to the website. Um, and then in 2021, we're seeing about five or 6,000 people a month. Wow. Um, so there's definitely an interest. And I'd say it used to be that the main people that, that asked for help were Goenka retreatants. <laughs> Which is a very intense style of meditation retreat. Right. So, so people who go on very intense retreats where you're meditating, you know, 15, 16 hours a day. That used to be our main group of people. And I'd say that that's large. Like that they're still coming, but we're also getting a lot more app users. Hmm. And that's really interesting because app users, I would assume, are not meditating, you know, that long per day. So it's not necessarily a duration related factor. Well, you'd be surprised. Really? I think it's, a, you know, it's a huge range. And that's actually the next set of research that we want to do is just so I'll just back up a little bit just in terms of like the sort of narrative arc was when we published the Varieties of Contemplative Experience study, this was basically the first big study on on meditation related challenges. Um, the lab phone started ringing uh-huh. and I was running a clinical trial at the time and we actually had to turn off the phone because it was starting to interfere with our research. Wow. And it started ringing and ringing. And um, I started talking to people like one a week, two a week, three a week, four a week, you know, it started climbing. Yeah. Um, and to the point where I actually had to, you know, create a nonprofit and start training staff to start handling the volume of people that were mm. requesting help. And that's now Cheetah House. That's now Cheetah House. Yeah. And yeah. we have several, we run two support groups a week. Um, we have, we interface with right now, I think we've had 26 different people from 26 different countries, um, check in with us. We have yeah consultations, lots and lots of, of videos and content like that. I mean, we're still growing, but it's definitely, um, we're, we're having a hard time keeping up with the volume. Yeah. Wow. I have a question coming up when thinking about the rise in app use and the lack of a teacher and any kind of um, customization or working on a personal level. What's your sense of the importance of working with the teacher? And then also, how do different teachers contextualize these experiences based on the tradition? Because I know sometimes in certain forms or lineages, really difficult experiences can just be viewed as like part of the path or, you know, you just kind of power through it. And so what's been your experience with that perspective? So, yeah. So I think, you know, backing up in, and this is actually, there's a, there's a big section in the varieties paper about the, how different Buddhist traditions uh, appraise different types of challenges. Mm -hmm. And it's by no means, a consensus. So for example, with the Nimitta, with the, with the star-like uh, lights, some traditions are mm -hmm. like, don't worry about it. Don't focus on it. You're not special. You know, kind of Zen. Zen mm -hmm. like, don't make anything about these experiences. They call them makyo. Mm -hmm. um, other, other traditions would be like, oh, you have the Nimitta. This is very important. Now forget about the breath. Now focus on the Nimitta. It's like a mm -hmm. big, big deal. Mm -hmm. And then there are certain types of experiences in certain traditions that require medical treatment and meditation is not the way forward. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it's a big uh, range, you know, so that's like traditional Buddhist textual support. Now you come into like, let's say America, MBSR or Spirit Rock or IMS or any of these, you know, Buddhist centers or, or pseudo secular, you know, Buddhist derived programs. And it's not entirely clear, like what context you're in. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you go to Spirit Rock for a retreat, are you in Theravada, Mahasi style? You know, which lineage are you in? Because different mm -hmm. lineages, even within the Theravada system, have different viewpoints on these different. Right. Um, and so, you know, often you get, they, they have a mishmash of different types of teachers from different lineages, sometimes even Tibetan teachers. Right. And then which one did you sign up for as the participant? You know, do you know which lineage you're in? So I think that, it, that that's a really confusing 
place that we're in, because I think that meditation is this confluence of religion, like clearly like a, a very, you know, firmly in the religion side. And then there's also like the psychology, secular, neuroscience, medical side. And then there's everything in between. And, and all of that whole spectrum is a, is a possible, is there's a spectrum of appraisals that go with these experiences. And so I think it's very, very, it's, a, it's, it's an unsolved question. I think it's, you know, you're asking a, a, like a hornet's nest of questions, you know. And so we actually have two other papers that I can refer you to. <laughs> um, one is called Progress and Pathology. And we actually interviewed the teachers. Let's see. Progress or Pathology, Differential Diagnosis and Intervention Criteria for Meditation-Related Challenges, Perspectives from Buddhist Meditation Teachers and Practitioners. So we did ask the teachers in the Varieties Project exactly this question. How do you tell the difference between, or how do you appraise these experiences? And, mm -hmm. and, and where's the line? Where do you say, like, keep going. I know it's hard, but, like, just keep going. And, like, this is part of the practice. This is part of healing. And when do you say, ooh, yeah, no, stop, do something different, mm -hmm. you know? And we were hoping that we would get this like amazing, you know, consensus statement. And that is not what we found at all. There was absolutely no consensus at all. Um, and so we basically have come to a place of, you know, pluralism, but also, you know, from the ethical standpoint, one that really is client-centered or person-centered, which is that to some extent, it's not the teacher that makes the decision by themselves. Right. It, you really need to consider what the goals are of the person whose experience it is. Yeah. You can tell them like, oh, don't worry. These like panic attacks and fear are part of like the third stage of XX path in the Buddhist model. You know, and they're like, I don't care. I don't I didn't you know, I, I don't want to have right. panic attacks. I came here for like peace and calm. So I see this happening a lot where the meditation teacher often misapplies a kind of Buddhist or spiritual lens and says, this is part of the path or this is expected or this is part of awakening. Mm -hmm. And the person is like, well, that's a total mismatch for what I'm doing here. Right. So I think that that's a really important place that we need to pay attention to. And that's a really big place that we unpack in the trainings. And actually, we're about to do another training uh, at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, um, where I'm, I'm sure we'll spend a lot of time unpacking this very issue. Because, you know, having your experience, you know, misunderstood, and in some ways dismissed by the people who are trying to take care of you is a, is a, is a form of secondary traumatization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I know the teachers are, this is what they've been taught and this, they're trying to normalize it. Yeah. And so it's just like, it's, it's with all good intentions, they're traumatizing people. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a really, really important, uh, question. So the first paper is, um, progress or pathology. And then there's another paper that we wrote. It's called challenging and adverse meditation experiences toward a person-centered approach. And we wrote that with my personal rock star, Lawrence Kermeyer, um, who is basically like the creator of cross-cultural, transcultural psychiatry. He's so great. Yeah. Yeah. So that one is in uh, the Oxford Handbook of Meditation. All of these are available on my Brown website. That one talks a lot about the issues of appraisal and that... The you know, I see a lot of times that people go into the appraisal kind of mindset and they end up ha sort of having this like philosophical question about what is and isn't an adverse effect. Meanwhile, this person is like freaking mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think we need to ground this discussion in compassion. Yeah, so it's a very, very difficult philosophical questions. But I think the ethics of making sure the person is cared for needs to lead the charge. Yeah, absolutely. So what um, do you have kind of take homes or advice from, you know, all of your work and from this perspective, both maybe for teachers of mindfulness or contemplative practice and for people who are practicing? I mean, I think one of the places that I have ended up and this whole journey has been very surprising. Like I asked, are there adverse effects of meditation? And then that ended up being like an incredibly complicated question. So 
Um, just the whole thing has been like a maze, but I think one of the places that I've ended up is I spend a lot of time sort of teaching people how to interact with, you know, spiritual systems, spiritual or, or meditation systems, because I Mm -hmm. think that often they, they, they don't really know what they want. And the, the promises and the claims are very elaborate and also kind of vague. And the people making the claims and, and are very compelling and they're really likable. And so there's just this kind of magnetism, but it's not really that well thought out. And so often mm-hmm. people end up doing, you know, jumping into a practice very intensely with a lot of expectations about what it's going to do for them. And they never really checked in at the beginning and like maybe made a list of like, what is it, what does well-being mean to you exactly? How would you know that like this practice is taking you in the right direction? And just like really write down like what your goals are and like where you're not going to compromise. And so like, for example, I see people who... When I, when I do this exercise with them and, and I say, like, what does well-being look like to you? What is your goal? How do you want to be? What does better look like? They say, like, I really want to feel connected to other people and the world. And I'm like, well, what practice are you doing? Well, I fo- focus on my breathing. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know how, for how long? Oh, hours and hours and hours a day I focus on the feeling of the changes in uh, temperature in my nostrils. I'm like, okay, so how is that making you feel connected to other people? Do you even see any other people? You know, like the (laughs) the practice and the like goal are like such a mismatch. Yeah. You know, one thing I think people don't really appreciate is like how many contemplative practices there are out there. Like, you know, mindfulness is only one of like a million different kinds of practices and like it can't do everything despite all the hype. Yeah. You know, it's like it has a very specific like set of things that it's really good at. And it's really good thing to have in your toolbox. But like if you're looking for connection with other people, like focusing on your breath might not be the one to do. And so I think that's where having a teacher or a guide of some kind is helpful to say to kind of help you match your practice to your goals. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think more importantly is to make sure you have your goals and to not compromise on them and to feel confident to say like, yeah, this isn't getting me where I want to go. I'm going to try something else. Because I think there's a lot of like power dynamics and authorities and various ways that people lose their agency when they step into these systems, even MBSR, even like secular systems they default to the teachers, they default to like the goals of the, you know, a, a much deeper Buddhist ideology, and they sort of forget themselves. So I spend a lot of time at Cheetah House and in the support groups, people kind of feel like they need to come back to themselves again and sort of start over and try to interface with practices in a way that is actually going to meet their needs. And one of the things they say that I'll just end with that they came up with on their own was asking themselves the question, is my practice serving me or am I serving my practice? Mm, That's great. Well, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time and I so appreciate all of your work in this space. I think it's so important um, for the field and as these practices continue to be taken up in our culture. So thank you, deep bows of gratitude. And um, yeah, just thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, good to see you. This episode was supported in part by Inspira Health. Show notes and resources for this and other episodes can be found at podcast.mindandlife.org. This episode was edited and produced by me and Phil Walker. Music on the show is from Blue Dot Sessions and Universal. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share it with a friend. If something in this conversation sparked insight for you, we'd love to know about it. You can send an email or voice memo to podcast at mindandlife.org. Mind and Life is a production of the Mind and Life Institute. Visit us at mindandlife.org, where you can learn more about how we bridge science and contemplative wisdom to foster insight and inspire action towards flourishing. There, you can also support our work, including this podcast. 